Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. You're probably not red teaming, and usually I'm not either. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute. Today's featured speaker is Deviant Olam, Security Auditor and Penetration Testing Consultant with the Core Group. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Deviant. All right, how is everybody doing? Thank you again for tuning in. I always enjoy both being at SANS events in person and reaching out to you here online. So this is a new one for me. This is not a new one in the sense that I'm about to be critical of some, maybe some sacred cows or just some uh, received wisdom that everyone thinks is, well, of course it's that way. Uh, I'm good at being critical about things. What I'm not always good at uh, is being critical of, of either myself or of trying to take myself down a peg. And I, as, as much as many other people in this industry, have used the term red teaming or the title red teamer in a way that I think is a little too broad in the past. I think it's a trend that still goes on. And hopefully if we tease apart some details, talk about where the industry gets it right or where the industry gets it wrong, we can, uh, we can all come away a little bit wiser and a little bit better positioned to serve the needs of others. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's no joke if anyone knows me, and many of you do, and you come up to me and say, hey, all the time, my job is fun, right? I am, for those who don't know me, I am the physical penetration and covert entry person in uh, SANS land and, and elsewhere. My team and I, well, we, we break into buildings. Uh, more and more, you start to see physical penetrations offered as part of the lineup of services that certain firms can conduct these days. But getting inside, uh, not just through social engineering, but getting inside through physical compromise of locks and doors and alarm systems and access controls, it's fun. And you'll see some videos along with the images as we go. I do know that the webinar can make some videos a little choppy, but even if it's choppy playback, you can tell. I mean, this is a locked door. This is actually a municipal water pumping station, and that door just sprung open with the use of a little hook. This is me being filmed by uh, another company trying to make a some production about, oh, what's this covert entry thing? Talk to me. And here I am down below a door using what's called an under door attack. And I actually opened it so quickly that the host looked at his cameraman. He said, did you get that? And the cameraman said, I don't know. Can you do it again a little more slowly? And by now, if anyone hasn't seen, good Lord, this, this infamous video of me showcasing a bank that was locked at night. My wife happened to have her phone out recording me and I just kind of blow a mouthful of whiskey right through the crack in this door, triggering a motion sensor on the inside, which pops the door lock. These and, and many other uh, clips and photos of me online have definitely an effect on people saying, oh man, that job is so fun. I, I wish my company offered services like that. I would love to get to do what you did. It must be so cool to be a, be a red team person like that. So let's, let's talk about that. I, I bet a lot of people believe what you just saw in those clips are examples of the skills of quote, red teaming. I'm gonna say it's not. I'm gonna say there's more to it than this and the definition has a little bit more nuance. So let's, let's get into this. Now, by no means am I the first person to try to bring some rigor and some discipline to these kind of topics. The idea of what is or is not a red team engagement has been talked about at length by Chris Nickerson, uh, his buddy Chris Gates. They, those two did a talk about adversarial simulation at BrewCon and Wild West Hack and Fest, uh, you know, the inestimable Dave Kennedy, right? Dave Kennedy was one of the first people I ever heard talking about a concept of a purple team. Carlos Perez also had a talk called Thinking Purple at DerbyCon. Uh, Chris Gates, again, he gave a talk with Hayden Johnson called Purple Teaming, the Cyber Kill Chain. He did that at Sector in Toronto. So well, what is purple teaming, right? I mean, we think we know what the red team is. We, we think we know what the blue team is. And all of a sudden people are saying purple. Well, is that just kind of mashing the two teams together? Is that all it means? Does it mean you take people with red team skills and blue team skills and hire them to work together on, on what? On engagements, on consulting? I think my favorite quote of the people you just saw on that slide was, was definitely Gates. Chris Gates said, oh yeah, I, I heard of that. Purple teaming, right? That's when you put a red teamer in the sock with the blue team 
uh, and then you just charge the client double for some reason because it's new. <laughs> well, okay, I guess that's a workable definition for some. But before we, we tease out purple and red, let's, let's go back to blue. Let's go back to the defensive side. There are three core elements to security. Any security model should be thought of in three facets, right? And they're all represented here, of course. They, you got your padlock, you got your ones and zeros, and you got your guy in a suit. And if you think I'm joking, just search stock image sites. They literally all have the padlock, the ones and zeros, and someone in a suit. Because of course you have to protect yourself from the person who's not in a suit. But as much as we like to joke about bad stock image, I mean, th this really does, those three elements are sort of correlated to the way we should be thinking about the layers or the surfaces of our security. Your padlock is your physical security. Your ones and zeros, what's that? Well, that's your network security. And I realize many times these are related, digital network security, physical security, tied together by who? Who's your trustworthy person, hopefully? Well, that's your, you know, the human side of your security. But that crossover is really where you get it. That, that's, that's where you get these interesting attack models and attack surfaces. So what about an electronic access control system? Is that, well, is that an electronic security? Is that, is that physical security? It's sort of both. Well, who's responsible for it? Who has ownership of it in the domain? This is something Chris Nickerson, a friend of ours, has talked about many times. The, the convergence of different surfaces are where you start to see really interesting attack options. So is this what red teaming is? What's that, that red starburst right in the middle, the convergence of all three areas? Is that where the red teaming like lives? It, it sure is red. Well, let's think about this a little more. Let's think about attacking on these different vectors. The physical vector, the, the, the lock picking and you know, covert methods of entry, what I'm very well known for. Many of you may have played with these sort of uh, tools and tactics, at least as a hobby, if not perhaps on a job. So sure enough, you know, lock picking, opening a lock, even a, a terrible little lock like this, a little wafer lock. Why would I show a wafer lock? Well, because it's the lock that holds, you know, everything else in the building, your key cabinets, your alarm panels, they're all behind terrible wafer locks. Well, that's one sort of a single surface attack. And it could be even more low tech. Here we see a door bypass. And in fact, I'm just using a piece of garbage, a little piece of plastic to pop into a server room. That's an obvious attack that people understand. They understand one method of attack against one surface, the physical surface. What about the digital surface? Well, plenty of people understand this kind of attack on the side of the attacker. It's not nearly as cool to show, obviously, on a screen. Look, Metasploit's happening. But many of you have these skills. Many of you understand if you're on the digital defensive side, well, you have to patch and harden your systems, segment your network. Many of you understand on the attack side, Yes, a digital attack means, well, I can get root on a box. Okay, there we go. Cool, interpreter session opened. I love the crossover idea though, right? I love the idea of here we have a badge system. Here we see literally a physical access control, but it's electronic. And what's happening if you've never taken one of our classes or seen other talks that we've given at SANS, here we have a sniffer tool, a covert interception tool that's actually going to be punched down on the bus wires, the actual WeGand bus behind this badge reader, which will give my team and I full credential logs of everyone using this door. It'll give us the ability to replay these credentials to get in later. We can sniff these credentials over the air and then turn them into a valid badge. But even this, normally kind of the realm of attack that you wouldn't talk about outside of governments a few years ago, even this is understood now. Oh, okay, yes, so this is a, a blended attack maybe on a couple surfaces, but I get it, sure. This sure is an attack, I understand that. And how many of you have taken, you know, Lance and other people have done securing the human, right? Attacking via the human vector. Social engineering, bluffing, look, just look like you belong there, right? We talk about this plenty of times. And for those who think this could never work, I mean, good heavens, this was a famous photo we've showed a few times. This was in Oklahoma a man dressed up like an armored car driver and walked out of a Walmart with $75,000. He just said, oh, I'm here for the, you know, here for the daily pickup. If you think that keep your head down and look like you belong there, it isn't valid. How about this guy? This is a famous video of a man who just stole a bunch of beer one weekend in Alabama. He doesn't work for the grocery store. He's just a guy with sort of an outfit on taking a big cart of, of cases of beer out the door. He did it to multiple grocery stores. So quote, look like you belong there. Absolutely a valid attack vector. I'm here to fix the phones. 
So we understand these independent vectors. But again, is this red teaming? Uh, all of these videos show people, my team and I, breaking into buildings. You see the badge reader. Let's, let's actually share a couple of brief stories together. And when we're done, I want you to tell me, and we'll talk about what is or isn't red teaming. And everyone likes my story, so here we go. Story number one, the elevator repair technician. So right off the hop, elevator technician's a great cover story if you have to do physical on-site work. Number one, elevator technicians don't show up too often. They're maybe there on a semi-annual unless something's really wrong. So people in the building don't know their elevator guy quite as well as they might know their FedEx person. Number two, anyone can kind of look like an elevator technician. I mean, here I am with a badge that says Otis, but I don't think Otis field technicians even wear badges, let alone ones that look like this. I just made one. And number three, anybody can be an elevator tech performing an emergency phone test. Now, I don't think anyone's going to get in real trouble for this. If you ever want to use it on a job, I don't believe it contravenes any local laws or ordinances. Anybody can perform an e-phone test. If you are in a building, you don't know what to do, just get in an elevator. If you've got your metal clipboard, you look like a contractor, kneel down, go ahead and press the call button on that emergency telephone. Want to know what an e-phone test is like? There are three steps. First and foremost, whenever anyone picks it up, sometimes it's a machine, an automated service, but many times you'll reach a human. It might be someone on site at a security desk. It might be someone at a remote service. It might even be the police. It doesn't matter who you reach as long as you start off by saying, <clears throat> this is a test of an emergency phone. I'm a technician performing a test. Let them know right off the bat it's a test. Even if the phone dials 911, it's probably not a big problem. Step two, you ask the other party, can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly right now? And you can drag that out a bit. You can, you know, can you tell one, two, three, one, two, three, can you hear me? Okay, very good, ma'am. And step three, the one that really, really is a curveball. You ask them, can you identify the location from which I am calling? And this one, sometimes if it's a guard, I, we, we've reached actual guards on site in the building as we did in this story that I'm about to tell you. And that really flummoxed them. They had, I don't know where you're calling from. And I, you know, we just drag that out a little bit longer, put them back on their heels a bit. So again, anyone can look like a contractor, that metal contractor clipboard, which I always use to hide a bunch of other bypass tools and things. So I'm in this building and I said, okay, I'm gonna do an e-phone test and I'm talking, you know, we reached a guard, the guard, you know, didn't know where I was calling from. And I said, oh, that's okay. We're just, we're just testing the elevator, sir. Now what happened on this job though, the teammate I was with, they had to go back to the hotel. They'd forgotten, a, you know, a remote Dropbox kind of device they were tasked with installing on the network. And I said, no problem. I'll just sit in this elevator. My teammate said, are you just going to, what are you, what are you going to sit? How long can you, I know you can make an e-phone test last a while, but you can't make it last an hour. I said, no problem. And I took out my keys. If anyone has seen my elevator hacking talk, just disabled the elevator from the key, the key switch. I sat in there and just read Twitter. And it turns out I'm glad that I had time to just read because the, the teammate at the hotel, things were going slowly. I won't get into exactly what went wrong, but it had to do with a faulty USB keyboard. And this poor soul was using on-screen keyboard with his in-room TV and an HDMI cable trying to set up his scripts. But I didn't mind. I was in an elevator. The elevator was disabled because I had turned it off. I just had it. Had it no one's going to bother me. I'm hiding in this elevator. Then I nearly had a heart attack because somebody I thought was pounding, pounding their hands on the outside of the, the, the hoistway doors. And I said, calm down, calm down, Dave. All right, look, this clearly it's, uh, look at my watch, it's 515. It must be the cleaners. They must be Windexing fingerprints off the doors. Turns out it wasn't. Turns out it, it was in fact a security guard. Now they weren't trying to get in the elevator, but I figured out what happened when my teammate came back from the, from the hotel. I, he radioed me, it's okay, I'll come let you in. I re-enabled the elevator, turned it back on. As I exited the elevator to let him in the lobby, I looked and there was a sign taped on the door. Literally, I had been in the elevator so long that they thought it was out of order. And they said, please use the elevators on the north bank, you know, the other side of the building. So we had a chuckle at that, but sure enough, now it's after five. Now no one's in the building. Who comes around the corner? Security guard. Now, fortunately for me, I've got what? I've got my metal clipboard and my Otis badge. First words out of his mouth, they're like, wow, you guys got here fast. And we said, oh yeah, you know, well, you're, you're paying for the uh, enhanced care. 
So let's, let's see if we can get this elevator running again. And, you know, I did some things with keys that looked like I knew what I was doing. And of course the elevator's running again. I had already turned it back on. I performed an e-phone test right in front of the, oh yeah, I heard there was some testing going on earlier, says the guard. Apparently during shift change, they communicated that. Oh yeah, well, you know, we're here for those elevators. You've had some kind of problems with newsflash. Every building has elevator problems, at least people think so. If you say, oh, the elevators are running slow, that oh yeah, we, we've had that problem. So what happened then? Well, we had the guard take us around. We had the guard say, oh, can we check your elevator controller logs? Maybe there's some uh, some entries on that database that'll explain the uh, error fault codes. We should check that. Guard let us in everywhere, escorted us around. My buddy dropped the pwn plug in the server room. Success. Because who doesn't want to keep their elevators running? Of course, you want to you want to trust your happy Otis technicians. So that's one story for you. We're going to ask in a minute if you think that's red teaming. How about here? Story number two, the cable technicians. I cannot stress how much a little bit of recon can really be a payoff if you want to look like you belong somewhere. If you find out who somebody's integrator is, who somebody's utility company is, any sort of firm that's a badge or a name that they recognize on site, you can turn that into a, a slightly convincing ID. If you have a badge printer, I, I encourage a lot of people to, if you do physical work, get a badge printer out in the field with you. You're making badges at your hotel room or your Airbnb. Get yourself some polo shirts that have the logo on them so you look like you belong there. This was a job where Babak and I were just walking around the building. We haven't even gotten in yet. We're just casing the whole place. We say, okay, so what do you see building? All right, there's a possible door on this side of the building. And, and as we're talking, it's late at night, Baba kind of said, hey, who's, who's that way over there? We look way across this dark parking lot, and we see a white truck. And, of course, sure enough, that, that's a security guard. We don't see the, the guard yet. We're looking. Again, it's very dark. Way across the parking lot in another building, we see somebody walking around kind of checking doors. We're like, oh, that's, that's definitely a security guard. Now, he hasn't seen us. And something we ask all of our students whenever we talk about social engineering, we say, all right, you haven't been spotted. You know the guard is there. They haven't spotted you. What do you do? And a lot of times students will say things like, well, definitely, you know, get back in your car, get out of there. We had one student say, look for the, the best bush you can hide in. I said, all right, I, I admire your, 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 your ingenuity of trying to find how to, you know, <laughs> conceal yourself. But every so often we'll get the, the, what we think is the right answer. And some students will say, go up and approach, make a new friend, which is what we did. We waved at him from across the parking lot, flashed our flashlights, called the guy over. And we started having a conversation. We just said, oh, look, we're here from Verizon. Uh, have you seen a, a big bucket truck? It's supposed to be coming out here tonight. We were just pulled off of another job. This is building 12, isn't it? It's, yeah, that's building 12. We say, look, well, obviously we can't, you can't let us in. We don't want you to do that, sir. And the guard says, no, I couldn't do that. We say, yeah, but look, we're looking for Phil Mickerson. He's the allegedly the manager of this building. He's supposed to let us in. That, you know, you haven't seen any, is this a nine to five? Is anyone here at night? We've knocked on all the doors. And the guard starts leaking some information. He says, oh, no, that I've never seen anyone out here past five, 530. I come around every couple of hours. You know, we, we, we don't usually have anyone out here. We said, oh, man, all right, well, we're going to try to figure out what went wrong. All right, thanks a lot. You know, is there a place to get a cup of coffee? We'll get out of your hair. And we left. But now we've got some information. We know the building's probably vacant. We know the guard only comes around every few hours. And more than that, he knows us now. Do you think he verified anything we told him? Do you think he could? What was he going to do? Is he going to radio dispatch and say, yeah, so there's some people out in the parking lot. Uh, they didn't ask me for anything. They didn't ask to be let in, and they left. That's an odd thing for a guard to call in. We weren't really trying to get in the building yet. We were just trying to find Phil. So we don't think, and even if he could, what's, who's he going to verify this with? Dispatch, are they going to know that Verizon was working in the area? Probably not. So we waited half an hour, came back. We did get in the building. How did we get in? Latch slipping. Again, these little latch hook tools. If you've never used one, if you've never tried one, Ask me in the questions about where we find them. Ask me about how many doors these work on. Simple tools that reach in, grab a latch, pull it away when a door is not fit properly. Absolutely a killer. So that's what got us in this building. So now we're in the office, we're moving around, 
we're popping computers, going into drawers that are unlocked. We found a server room. I'm trying to under door tool on this uh, server room, right? Eventually I get in there. Sure enough, this is fantastic. But at one point, as I'm walking down a hall, Bob comes up to me and says, hey, hey, Dave, you got to come put, put that stuff away. Put your bags down. Come. I think I hear someone. So we walk around, around a corner. Sure enough, there's the guard, the guard we made friends with in the parking lot. First words out of his mouth were not, hey, what are you doing in the server room? They were not, hey, are you sure you're supposed to be in this part of the building? Because to him, oh, we're those nice, helpful, polite people. First words out of his mouth were, hey, did you guys find Phil? We said, of course we did. Phil let us in. We're all good. But it hasn't been two hours. So now we're a little curious. We say, hey, I thought you only came around every couple of hours. It's only been, you know, 45 minutes or so. What's, uh, what's going on? Well, it turns out he had been dispatched over and over to a door that we kept opening. We were opening a door and we didn't see. Normally we bypass all the door sensors. But there was one door. We didn't catch a door sensor and it kept alerting a silent alarm. He kept being dispatched, clearing it, being dispatched, clearing it. And five, and we told the client this. We said, look, you know, we had, we had an interaction with your guard in the, in the building. They said, no, that could never have happened. We said, no, pull your tickets. And they did. They pulled the dispatch tickets. And sure enough, you know, door 21J, door, door 21J, can't find any signs of forced entry. Verizon is working in the building and may have propped door open. Instructed field technicians to keep doors closed. After 30 seconds, they will alert. So that level of interaction with the guard, of course, you know, look, 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 look like you belong there. Who wouldn't trust us? So that was another big win. That was a great job and it was very valuable for the client. They didn't fire anybody, thankfully. They did some education. That was a, that was a really positive experience. Again, was this red teaming? Well, let's talk about it after the last story. The last and final story I'll give you is the armed guard story. Now, most of the time, our jobs don't involve regular, our jobs involve regular guards, not armed guards, right? So most of the time, regular guards are not very well trained. This was a guard desk in a building where literally the guard is just not there. And there are just all these log books of packages received and the building keys and the building key cards. I just sat there in the guard's chair with all the key cards, just kind of spinning around in the chair, waiting to see if somebody would come along again late at night. I don't know where this person is. They never came back. I got bored and eventually walked away. But that's an average guard. Armed guards tend to be a little more on the ball. Now, have we done armed guard jobs? Yes, we have. Have we ever been worried? Not really. Armed guards aren't going to engage with lethal force unless you're doing something very egregious. But they are a little more sharp. They're a little more frosty. So we said, all right, let's see how this, how this job's going to go. We wanted to grab some electronic credentials to get into a more secure part of a building. If anyone has never seen any of our electronic access control presentations or, again, take any of our classroom time, we talk about weaponizing long-range HID kind of badge readers, long-range RFID credential readers. A battery pack, a little boost converter, the big coil allows you to put this in a bag or backpack. And if you just get next to somebody, this video here, this is a badge grab right out of the, you know, the other guy's pocket about a foot away. There's our friend Dennis getting successful credential grab off somebody and he never had to touch them, never had to reach into their pocket. So we said, all right, let's do this. We know these guards all have badges. We're gonna put a, you know, a badge reader, a big long range weaponized badge reader in our laptop bag, send somebody in, try to get close to them, try to get a badge read. So who are we gonna send in? Well, these are armed guards, right? What do most armed guards aspire to be? Many of them are trying to career track one day to be a cop. We said, all right, well, one of the guys on our team used to be on the force, send in a cop. We're like, Rob, get in there, just cop it up, man. Talk about police things. So Rob goes in. Bobak is out in a car. So Rob drove, this is late at night, you know, it's 10, 10, 11 at night, middle of the winter, parking lot's cold, the car is cold. You can't leave a car running, that just looks weird. Rob pulls up with his car, walks in the front door, and Bobak is in the back seat under a couple of coats. And he's remotely connected to the badge reader, trying to see if we're getting results from that from that hunt pad. He will send a message to Robert saying, all right, we've got a badge, get out of there. Robert had to walk so far into the vestibule that he lost signal with Bobak almost immediately. So now Bobak's completely blind, but just in the back seat, shivering. Robert keeps trying to get close to these guards and he must've spent almost an hour in this lobby because the guards being armed 
it's a natural part of their training. Their inclination is to blade off. They go strong side back. And if you get near one, they'll start, to, they'll just blade their body away. So every time Robert tried to walk near somebody, they would subconsciously, without even, they just kind of take one step back. And Robert's, you know, he puts his bag on a counter and it holds up his phone, says, hey, why aren't these restaurants good? And hoping they'd lean over the counter with their badge. Nothing happening, nothing working. But persistence is key, right? Finally, start saying goodbye, start shaking. All right, well, fellas, I'll see you later. The last guard he says goodbye to, Robert goes for broke. He says, all right, this is going to either be it or not. Swings his laptop bag in front of him, just gives the guy a surprise hug. And kind of, I think he tells the story. He, he held on to it a good second or two. It made it a little weird. Says, all right, fellas, see you later. I'll leave. Gets back out to the car where Bobak's still freezing. Says, what took you so long in there? Robert said, I think I think I got to read. I think I got to read. They just went immediately. They pulled over on the side of the road, popped out the SD card. Robert's, you know, Bobak's talking to the badger. Look, oh my gosh, all right. We got one good credential. But whose credential did we have? we had guard permissions. The next day, they were on a new shift. Everyone comes back with copies of the guard badge. We bluffed our way past when the, you know, people in plain clothes are badging into the building and the, the terminal that the security is looking at says guard, guard. It says, what are this? What's this? It's, oh, these are VIP badges. They, they expire at midnight. We just came in from the, you know, California office. Okay, says the guard, because the badge works, right? It beeps, it's green. We got into an elevator, overrode some elevator restrictions to get to a locked out floor. They made it to the server room. Bobak picks the lock on the server room door, gets in there, right up to the network rack. Now we weren't actually allowed to connect to their network, but we physically demonstrated we could. We could, we could touch the infrastructure. Complete win, complete win across the board. Now the big question, which one of these scenarios counts as red teaming? You've heard three stories. Which one was the red team engagement? How do you judge? We've talked about this a little bit earlier. Is it the all surfaces litmus test? Do you have to attack successfully on the physical, the electronic, and the human side? Let's see which, which story did that. How about the first story, the elevator repair story? Well, we walked into a building. I hid in an elevator for a while. I encountered a guard. I kind of bluffed my way through in interacting with that guard by showing some, oh, look, I'm here from Otis. And then the guard escorted us everywhere. Was that red teaming? Well, I, would, I would really just call that social engineering. We really didn't touch a lot other than the human surface in terms of leveraging our access. So was this a red team engagement? No, no, I would not say so. But a lot of people would think it is. Oh, I did that red teaming thing. I bluffed my way into that building. How about this time? How about the cable technician story you heard, right? We're here from Verizon. So we walked around a building. We interacted and social engineered a guard pretty effectively. We were able to physically get through a locked door, a couple of locked doors, in fact, using bypassing and picking. That's a blended attack, but it's a blended attack on only two of the three surfaces. Is that red teaming? Was this a red team engagement? I'm going to say no. It does not qualify in my mind. Well then, process of elimination, right? We must be talking about the third story. What happened there? Well, we had this hunt pad we had prepared. We established some rapport, so a little, little human sector. We grabbed that RFID credential on the digital vector. Okay, we made a new digital badge. We got past some more guards, elevator systems. I would call this digital. Oh, then we picked those locks and bypassed our way in. Okay, physical. We've got every of the three, you know, the three surfaces. Now we only feigned the network attack, but we could have absolutely done that. Weren't allowed to connect it. We demonstrated full impact across everything. Was this a red team engagement? Maybe this must be the one, right? You know what? For me, it's not. I'm not going to call any of these three stories. Fun as they were, none of these three, in my opinion, qualify as true red teaming. How come? That last one, a lot of you might have thought, oh, this must be it. I mean, they, they hit all the surfaces, they did all the things. Some people are gonna get hung up on the fact that, well, we weren't allowed to touch the network, right? Because the network wasn't in scope. Oh, do you have full scope, no scope? Is that what makes something a red teaming engagement? How much scope? A lot of people, a lot of people hang their hat on this argument. And you'll see people, even friends of mine talk about this. Their red teamers can't have a limited scope, right? 
adversaries don't have scope, therefore a red team can't. I disagree. I think adversarial testing to be valuable for defenses, you shouldn't have artificially ridiculous scope, but there are certain things that can be in or out of scope. Here's the example I like to make. Let's say you are charged with testing the efficacy of bulletproof vests, body armor. You might have someone on your team, how many people know the red team are like this? There's, oh, we're testing the, the soft body armor. We're gonna test our bulletproof vest. Well, let me, let me go ahead and get my artillery cannon my light weapon here. I'm going to point this at this bulletproof vest. Let's see how that goes. Blam! And then they look at you, they ha, oh, bulletproof vest, pull my leg. This was a terrible, t I, I blew it right away. Well, if the client wasn't testing whether their bulletproof vest could face a cannon, then you just wasted everyone's time. If cannons are not in scope, that makes sense. And you don't do that. That's, that's, you, I'm sorry, this is just where I start to rant. I, we know people like this. We know people who think they are the king of all kings and look at how badass they are. Stop thinking you know more than the client. A lot of red teaming has its best value when you are modeling the correct threat. When you do actual adversarial modeling, you sit down on your kickoff calls, you really do the, the research and engage with the client to figure out what their threat is and you model the relevant threat. Because what do clients ultimately care about? Most of the time, and I'm gonna borrow from my buddy Chris again on this one, he says a client only cares if a vulnerability is going to cost them money or make them look bad. That's it. If you can't demonstrate that something you did would cost them money or make them look bad, many times the two are related, you're not doing a really good job red teaming. So what is the actual job of a red teamer? Well. We've talked about thinking unconventionally. You have to be able to think a way an attacker would think, not the way a conventional defender would think, and make your attack across all surfaces, yes. However, you have to model the relevant threat. If, again, if you're testing bulletproof body armor, it's not supposed to face off against a cannon. If you're testing how strong a lock or access control system is on a front door, it's not supposed to face off against a wrecking ball. So model the relevant threat. Yes, you should demonstrate real impact. Being theoretical is fine on a tabletop exercise, but as people like to say, well, uh, someone in their reports, well, what we could have done, we could have gotten your badge and cloned it. And they say, well, did, did you do it? No, well, no, but it, theoretically it's, no, well, did you do it? Is the question that people like to ask. A true red team engagement demonstrates actual impact. But all these, these points, while they're valid, we're missing something. There's a fifth point. There's a key, key element that none of my stories actually showed you. What was missing? You've seen it in all the pictures I was showing you. The blue team. Where is the blue team in all of this? That's what red teaming is. Red teaming is not the same thing as pen testing. Pen testing, you show up, you break into a lot of stuff, and you leave. Red teaming, by its very nature, you can't have one without the other. The red team has to interface with the blue team to provide, that's what a red team's value is. A famous analogy that has been used, and I love it, is the idea of sparring. You are an adversary who is there specifically to make the blue team better, to work and play up their strengths, to build their talents. How many people think this is red teaming? The idea of one person is way more powerful, completely outclasses the defender, and absolutely wrecks them just smashes them beyond all belief, boom. And then what happens? Well, you come back six months later, the red team, the, the penetration tester, if you will, is just as strong as they were. The blue team is just as defenseless as they were. And you get the same result six months later. Is that valuable to the client? No, not at all. What you want to see is engaging with the defenders after your, after your attack. You wanna see the defenders getting stronger. You want to build this into your jobs if you can. Please, I beg of you. When you start thinking about your gig, if you're just a pen tester, that's fine. Most pen testing jobs are just, all right, we plan, we knock things down, we write a report. Or frankly, in most of our lives, because jobs are scheduled too close together, you're bouncing from one job to the next so quickly that you're writing the report on the plane. I mean, I've, I've known companies that do this.
in my world though, that's that's just pen testing. If you're a blue teamer, please build into your job schedule some time on site with, I'm sorry, if you're a red teamer, please build time with the blue team. And let's let's look at some examples, right? I have, I have some good pointers for you here, some fun things. This was after the conclusion of a successful intrusion of a data center. Now, what are we? What is the footage here? I know that the footage may be a little choppy. I'll show you an image in a second. We're using a mirror and a flashlight up near the top of a door. What are we looking for on this door? I referenced it earlier. That's a door sensor. That's a door contact sensor, right? Why are we showing, why am I talking about this? Well, we literally walked around this whole data center with the blue team. We took them out of the sock. We said, look, here's what we did to get in this door. Here's the, we slipped a magnet up in the door frame. We showed them the magnet sensor sensitivity. We showed them, we said, all right, well, how can we make your, did your sensor log show anything? All right, let's tune the sensitivity. Oh, you got an alert, but you didn't get alert. That was a force door condition. Here, you, and I get told again, here, stand on this, stand on this ladder. You get up there, check the door sensor. And the blue team actually getting to pretend they were the adversary. That to me is red teaming. Not sticking a red teamer in the sock, getting the blue team out of the sock and walking around with you, showing examples of exactly the tactics you used, and then they can fine tune their defenses. Bobak actually spent time in one of the IDF closets looking at their door controller. All of these inputs for various sensors around their door sensors should be supervised inputs, meaning if there's any disruption, if they say that if the signal goes high or low, it should alert. A lot of them weren't configured right. And he's there on the radio with a blue teamer and he's just unplugging door sensors. Okay, trying door 12. Did you get it? No, you didn't get no alarms. All right, mark that down. Trying door 10. The alarm goes, all right, door 10 is con configured, right? That was an alarm. Let's try door eight. So going around and showing people things we found. This is a medical facility where we actually showed, look, all right, you've got these nice keypads, but you have all of these extra switch boxes. Has anyone ever looked at what they are? And the whole blue team said, no, we, we never really use those. I think there's some sort of emergency something or other. They were, in fact, they were an emergency override that would unlock the doors in the event of system failure. Well, what do we see on the back here? We see a tail cam of a key switch. We see a momentary button that would, yes, indeed, unlock the door. But does anyone see this little red button up here? What's that? That's a tamper sensor. That's a tamper switch. If you take this face plate off, that should set off an alarm. I realize this is a photo, not a video. If it were a video, you would not be hearing any alarms. These were not configured correctly on half the doors we checked. And again, the blue team had no idea because no one had actually walked them through this kind of an attack before. Once they knew what it was, they knew how to guard against it. The next time we came back, everything was much tighter. They had all these switches working. My favorite job ever that we actually really saw a good traction with a blue team getting better was a biometric reader once. A big data hall and a data center had a biometric reader. I won't get into the nitty gritty. You can ask me in the Q&A. Essentially, we leverage the fact that we gand in, we gand out. We just kind of bridged our connections and took the biometric reader out of the loop. We were actually able to do a pass-through attack and show them, look, when, when this biometric reader is off the wall, the way you have the system set up, it's you shouldn't be wiring it this way. It's easy to bypass. The client was so impressed, the next day they had technicians out there changing the configuration, making it harder to make this attack feasible. So by all means, that was some of the best value ever. Even though it'll make our job harder as attackers, interfacing with the blue team so that they get better after you've come around and knocked everything down, that's what your job as a red teamer should be. Now, I don't just want to finger wag and be very prescriptive here, so I'm going to give you an extra little gift, as I always like to do. I don't think in any of my previous SANS talks I've given a huge rundown of key to like systems in terms of my current allotment of keys that I like to carry. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by keyed alike systems? Well, lots of entry systems, in fact, telephony access control systems are some of the biggest, biggest offenders on the front of doors. Lots of entry systems come from the factory keyed alike and their keys are all well known and easy to purchase. This is a linear system, if you're curious, in this photograph right here. All the linear systems use this little key right here. What can you do if you get inside of these panels with a key to like system? Well, inside you have a nice momentary switch. 
that will allow you just to fire up whatever door relay is inside the cabinet. Here I am getting into a gated facility without even getting out of my car. Reaching in, there's my key. Reach inside here, little momentary switch that I'm just gonna press with my finger, beep. And now I don't have a badge for this building. I don't have a pin code for this gate, but sure enough, the gate is open. Outstanding, right? So yes, the idea of using a key, if you have the right key to get into a lot of these boxes, absolutely very nice to have. Here's another brand, Door King. You may have seen me talk about Door King in the past because boy, do they have some market penetration. Door King systems, the Door King 16120 key. You better believe I carry that with me all the time too. Why? Because if you're inside that cabinet, you can absolutely trigger door releases. An example of this here. So we have a locked gate for this building here. We have a door king system. Now there's a lot going on here and we could talk about the electronic attack surface. We can talk about pretending you belong there like a delivery person using the delivery access lock. But what am I going to do? I'm just gonna reach in behind this panel, press a momentary switch and away we go because the door kings are all key to like and that door is open. There are a number of key to like systems and I love to provide people with my list of favorite key to like keys if you do any physical jobs. Many of you follow me on Twitter, the CH751. Oh my goodness. The CH751 is sort of America's primary baloney key. Any rinky dink little wafer lock. This is a generator that somebody opened up. This is a shed outside of some building that had some wiring in it that opened up medical facility had their panels with CH751, hazardous storage in this building, CH751. This is all the same key. These are not a bunch of different keys that have the same name. Literally, all these keys are operating all these locks and they're all the same key. This is not the storage cabinet that you just saw, by the way. What's this? Well, somebody tweeted at me. This is a snowcat. The keys to their snowcat were a CH751. In the security world, absolutely, you will see access control systems and alarm systems where the panel is a CH751. That key box I showed you earlier, that key box was a CH751, giving me access to the whole building. Extra hilarious is the fact that this, this entire office's key collection has within it no less than three additional CH751 keys. So if you want to buy yourself a CH751, keep it on your key ring, you'll never be You'll never be uh, alone in places if you want to use it. It's, there's a lot of places you'll find it works. A little bit less of an application, but also worthwhile, depending on if you want to get into key to like systems, is the 1284X. It is not the only vehicle key that's universal out there, but it's one of the biggest. 1284X is Ford Motor Company's primary fleet key, which means that there are a significantly non zero number of police cruisers out there in the country that operate on their doors on their trunks, on their glove boxes, and yes, even on their ignitions with the same key. The 1284X key is not a chipped key, it's not electronic, but sure enough, it'll start up a car, there away you go. So I like, I like talking about key to like systems because they really blow people's mind. The idea that how are all these things keyed the same? My favorite one for those of you who do network pen tests as well, who's seen this lock before? A lot of you have, maybe you've seen it in this situation. Yeah, it looks familiar to you. This is a lock made by the Emka company. The Emka company is an industrial cabinetry firm. They make tons of hardware that is popular in server environments and on network racks. The entire Emka product line is effectively three keys. And of those, the middle one there, the EK333, is I'm going to say like 90% of the locks from MCA I've ever found. So what do I carry with me all the time? This is the little gift I'll give you. This is my everyday carry set. And if we wanna talk about true red teaming, let's think about the three surfaces that you can attack on, physical, digital, and human, right? Well, we didn't mention this tubular key. This is an FEOK1. If you've seen my elevator hacking talk, that was a previous webcast. FEOK1 is a very popular elevator key. It's the one I use to demonstrate to that guard, look, I'm here working on the elevators. You can do some social engineering with that. That EK333 key, the EMCA server rack and server cabinet key. Well, that allows you physical access to digital resources. C415A and the 222343s at the bottom. The 222343 
Well, that's the linear key. C415A and the CH751, those are just two very common physical keys that open a lot of cabinets and you know file drawers, desk drawers. What's this? The 16120, that was your door king. Again, another blended surface, physical but electronic access control system. I personally keep a couple jigglers on my everyday set just so I have them, and I round it out with that 1284X key if I want to, I don't know, I've never, you would never pretend to be an officer, but it sure is funny if you show people who are officers, hey, look, I can open your doors. That's, just, that's never really been done on a job, but it's definitely been a source of mirth at times. This whole set fits, folds up nicely in my pocket. By the way, what's, what's dangling on the end here? What's this? Well, that's a wire loop inside of many of these boxes. And again, we get more deeply into this during our network access controls and our electronic access controls class. Here we have a door king system that I'm going to use what key? I'm going to use that 16120 key to open the door king box. And inside, even though there's no override switch hooked up, I can still just take my wire loop bridge those two contacts on the panel and boom that fires the door relay and that's going to let me in so if you want to carry a red teamer key ring or a pen tester key ring or sometimes called deviance devious key ring this is absolutely the way we do it we fold it on up it's in all of our pockets it's in all of our job bags so that's my little extra bonus gift to you i don't want to just you know you know be angry at people who use terms wrong i want people to use terms right and use keys right so how will we conclude all this? And then we'll jump to your questions. Well, a lot of this talk was not just about skill building, but untangling terminology. And one of my favorite friends in the industry, his name is Patrick, he wrote a whole blog post called On Pen Testing, Professionalism, and Chill. And in this blog post, he, you know, he talks about how if you understand, if you have a really good kickoff call with the client, if you understand what people really want it's the first step in a, in a really successful engagement because using the incorrect terms, telling the client you're delivering something that they weren't thinking they needed, you can sort all that out if we're all on the same page when we start. And that's better value for us, it's better value for them. So I'm really happy that he wrote that up. I encourage everyone to check it out. I encourage everyone, if these are topics that you like to hear, give SANS your feedback, stay connected with the SANS community because any one person can say, boy, I sure feel better now that I know that red teaming means this and not that. Well, if you're not sharing with others, if you're not communicating this fact to others, you're just one person with a definition and the rest of the industry is going another direction. So by all means, follow up at future SANS events, stay online, stay connected, come out to the next SANS ICS. The Oil and Gas Summit is coming up. In general though, whether you think you're on the blue, the blue side or the red side of the house, Working together is how we, we become better together. I love the sparring analogy. I love the idea that no one should go away from a job feeling like they were the king victor and everyone else was just left smoldering in the ashes. Yes, it's fun getting in. Getting caught is the goal. So that's what I hope for everyone else. I hope whether you do the network side, the human side, the physical side, or a combination thereof, that you understand that we should all be working together to make things better together. So let's keep making things better together. And that's my, that's my take on red teaming and where I define it, how other people define it, and how hopefully we can all move the ball a little further down the field. And let's see, let's see about questions here now. I'm trying to expand my questions window. Fantastic webcast. Yes, uh, thank you very much, but I cannot or is, is it just Steve didn't actually have a full question. So Steve just said, fantastic webcast, thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. Out of a hundred and some odd people who are participating in our webcast today, you're the only one who's spoken up. Not a question, but that's, I'll take it. You're very welcome. Ah, so I'm trying to scroll through a number. All right, we do have some questions here. Let's see. Ah, the, the questions window is just, monstrously small and does not seem to have any possible way of expanding itself. Oh, so Deviant, I would suggest you click um, to the right of the word questions. Uh, there's like a square with an arrow that'll unlock. If you hover over it, that's the way to unlock it from the control panel. To the right of the word questions is a box that just says ask her. Um, it, it's still locked in the control panel, correct? 
It is in the control panel, yes. Okay, so if you're on the tab that says questions, uh, just move your cursor to the right still in that gray bar mm -hmm. and hover over it. You can unlock it from the control panel. Or I'd be happy to read them for you because there are quite a few. Let's have you read them off because this is, uh, right. I'm not seeing what you're seeing, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm, not no a hard, I'm not an electronics guy. I'm a hardware guy. It's okay. Uh, where do you find the latch tools is the first question. Oh, sure, sure. So latch tools that you saw in those slides and videos, sometimes they're called shrum tools, sometimes they're called traveler hooks, sometimes they're called loiting tools. The, uh, the actual source where we order them is in the garment and textile industry. They are a textile tool. I don't recommend you have to go through that kind of industry. If you want, there's the redteamtools.com website to be a little self-serving. That is where all of our students after we issue them to every student in our SANS classes and elsewhere. But if anyone wants more of them and follow up, oh, I want one for my other toolkit, uh, redteamtools.com is where you can get yourself set up there. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, someone says, I clearly follow the wrong career path. How do I start a career with the Red Team Alliance? All right, very cool there. So. This is a bit of a development now that I and a number of people across other parts of this industry have pushed for. The, the notion of red teaming doesn't really have a standards body the way, I mean, obviously SANS has the GIAC on the electronic side, especially uh, offensive security and others. They have actual, you know, OSCE, OSCP. The red team certification group and with it, the red team alliance is a body that's been put together by a number of us trying to bring some demonstrated competencies to the industry. So actual lock picking, lock opening, door opening, demonstrated competencies to gain a cert that can be backed up. Uh, so if you wanted to follow up with us, follow up with us at the red team alliance, that is possibly what we might say is a good foot in the door option for some people having a real cert that says not just, well, I've read some, some of this online. I, I watched a YouTube video once. That's half the people out there that say they do physical penetration. Uh, following up with us, attending some of our SANS courses. I don't like to sound like I'm selling you hard here, but definitely um, getting a cert that has real competency and meaning behind it. You know, that's, that's, a, that's paired with an exam is at least a foot in the door. Uh, speaking of courses, which course do you teach? So at the SANS, uh, the SANS events, uh, the next one coming up is SANS Network Security in Vegas in about a month. So you'll find a lot of our content. Uh, we are not full-time SANS instructors because this is a, it's a niche topic. It's kind of, if you've seen what, what Jason and all of his team have to, they have these crates of Pelican, you know, gear. They already carry enough stuff to the SANS conferences. They don't need to be hauling boxes of locks and lock tools and access control devices like we do. So we are what's called a hosted course. If you look in any of the SANS programs, uh, at the very bottom of the list usually are the hosted courses. And I believe I just talked to Susie the other day. I think we still have some room for the SANS network security class that's coming up. There's still some seats left in that one. Otherwise, uh, you know, catch us at Orlando, catch us at Austin. I believe we're going to be on the docket there or reach out to us on Twitter. And you can always ask us, hey, where, where are you guys going to be next? All right, thanks. Uh, you have a lot of feedback. Fantastic webcast. Thank you. Exceptional. Uh, great as always. Great presentation. And uh, now, <laughs> now I'll move on to the next question. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I think you covered people. Are, people are asking about good resources to learn. Oh, this one's specific. Do you have any good resources to learn lock picking? Wow, that's that's also like a a teed up self-serving answer, I guess, because I wrote a book years ago that is still in print because, oh, and I think uh, someone in my house is handing it to me right now, in fact. Thank you, dearest. <laughs> wow, it's like the Magic Man show right here. <laughs> so Practical Lock Picking and Keys to the Kingdom were two books that I wrote. Um, man, I, I am not good at sales. I'm super uncomfortable. I'm gonna put these away. That makes me, makes me nervous holding up stuff that I've written like that. But yes, I mean, I've, I've written a couple books Honestly, um, as much as a reference as they can be, there's almost no substitute for really hands-on, uh, hands-on type courses. So if you don't go through us, there are great courses taught down in Kentucky. If you wanted to go down to the Lockmasters Security Institute, they're a little bit more focused on 
uh, people in the professional trade of locksmithing than they are on entry technician work. And I, I'm not going to lie, as, as far as covert entry technician work, covert methods of entry, uh, you're either going to you know, go through us or you'll get trained by other people who we trained. And that's kind of always a fun thing when someone says, oh, we had that you know, great pen testing job. Our company's got a great crop of people and we find out who works at that company. I'm like, oh, right, 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 right on. We, we trained 90 percent of you. Good, good, good candidates there. So, yeah, um, our class, most of our classes all start with a foundation in basic uh, mechanical manipulation and bypassing. And then we have other modules, the electronic access controls, the safe manipulation courses, you name it. We, we've got a hand in it. All right. Well, specifically, some people are wondering um, how to check lock picking laws, where to get sets of common keys, and then, re you know, regarding state to state laws, like how do you get a uh, sure a course so, to be registered in your lot, state? <laughs> a lot of people are possibly asking this because many of them may have just attended DEF CON at Las Vegas, where the reception was not as warm and fuzzy at the Caesars as it has been in the past. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Tool, Tool with three O's, T-O-O-O-L. So Tool, the open organization of lock pickers. Uh, I'm on the board of that. Tool is a nonprofit that does outreach and education on a very basic level about locks and lock systems. There is a map on the Tool website, Tool with three O's, Tool.us is where you can see the map. The, the, the chapters meetings page has a link to this big colored map where we show all the nation's laws concerning locks and lock, lock pick tools. Lock picks are usually defined as burglary tools, but many things are defined here. Let me, let me reach across my desk here. Oh, look, I have burglary tools right here. Oh, am I, am I going to jail? No. Well, because most common hardware implements can be defined as burglary tools if there is demonstrable criminal intent. And that's the big key. As long as you're not doing something that demonstrates you have criminal intent, you're usually fine. Now, say so usually, there are a handful of states, four real states of four or five states of concern, where the law is a little bit hazy. And one of those states is Nevada. This year at the Las Vegas events and the trade shows and, and at the Caesars property in particular, there was more friction than in the past because of misunderstanding about the nuances relating to Nevada law. Uh, I am not a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. I have paid lawyers though, and my lawyers assure me that no, it is not a go directly to jail, do not pass go problem with lockpicks, even in Nevada. I would encourage people to research it a little more on their own. If you want, you can start again with the tool website. We have, we have links to and citations of every criminal statute from all 50 states and the district. So do I think it's a big problem? No. Do I ship and sell lockpicks everywhere? Yes. I mean, like the firm that I mentioned does, the firm redteamtools.com. That is, that is where all of our stu students go to get more tools. We issue them in the class. If they break them or want more, or they want to give them as gifts. I'm like, yeah, sure. The same one I gave you in class, you can have that same pick set, you know, just buy it online. And that has never really been a major problem for anyone I know, as long as they're not being dumb, as long as there's no demonstration of criminal intent. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. How would you get past the metal plates on the outside to doors to protect the latches? So guard plates or shielding plates that are over top of the latch work on a door. Couple of ways. Uh, one, here, let me reach into a bag over here. So what I have in my field kit, I don't know if anyone can see that. That's piano wire. So absolutely a valid vector of reaching down behind a door plate, fishing piano wire in and trying to snap the door latch if the latch is not fit properly. Uh, that's worked on a number of occasions for us. Other times though, if the plate is up there over the panel and over the latch, uh, many times the best vector is under the door. So that under door attack, reaching up on the inside, grabbing, pulling down on the interior door handle that will usually release the door, or we have a different tool that's very similar that works against crash bars. Doing something to release the door mechanical mechanism that way, doesn't matter what the plate's doing because now the entire latch has actually been retracted by the door handle or the bolt work. Is there a guard that goes under a door? Yes. Uh, the Asa Abloy company makes something called the PEMCO 530, P-E-M-K-O, PEMCO 530 model, I believe it is. 
which is a popular retracting door bottom that when the door shuts, it drops down, locks into the ground, uh, prevents underdoor incursions. All right, thanks. I think we have time for one last question. How right. often do you come do you come across secured access doors with badge readers next to them, but the door hinges are on the wrong side where the pins can be simply punched out and the door removed? A significantly non-zero number of times this has happened. Um, many, many, many exterior doors are designed by it's it's conventional construction is in swing style doors. So we um, we will see that you know the hinges are, are not as visible there, but outswing doors do happen, especially in office environments. If you have, you know, here's a server room and it's in a hallway, sure enough, that door might swing outward, in which case the hinges are facing you. Now, there are better designs of hinges. There are what are called um, security hinges, where they actually have a peg sticking through. When the hinge closes, this little peg actually pops into the place. And now, even if you knock the hinge pins out of the you can't wrench this hinge apart from the outside. Uh, that's a nice option to use in such an environment. But I will not lie, that it's dumb as it sounds, I have absolutely popped hinge pins out and just walked a door away from the wall and slipped in the other side. Um, just as easy as that is sometimes going over the drop ceiling or, yeah, the, you're, the question asker, they're, they're, they're right on the money in terms of dumb vectors that often work, despite the fact that you have this beautiful electronic you know, multi-factor keypad badge reader thing. So does it happen? Yes, not often, but it does happen. Um, is it is it bypassable? Yes. Is it fixable? Yes. And that's, um, that's, I think, kind of summarizes our whole industry, right? That's a good ending question because sometimes the silliest vectors are easy to fix, but they're still very prevalent and very exploited on jobs. And then you have the satisfaction of both getting in and showing the client how simple it is to, to repair their problem. Any other questions, uh, you can always find me on uh, Twitter. I think my last slide there had my, my various guises of information. You can catch me on the Twitter, you can catch me at a bar, at a conference, but this is always, this is always fun. I'm really glad to be here and yeah, thank you all so very much. All right, and DB and LB at Network Security, so I'll look forward to meeting you there. <laughs> Thank you so much for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.